signed. This is the Northern. Okay, if we now move into public session, the session is now open to the public. Uh, further chairperson's business will be considered in public session. Uh, first item on the agenda is Budget No. 2 Act Northern Ireland 2020. I'd like to inform members the Budget No. 2 Bill has received royal assent. The Budget No. 2 Act Northern Ireland 2020 became law on 17 June 2020. Uh, committee input on FOI matters during the summer recess. It was either Phil or Kate. Okay, right. Uh, Committee input on FOI matters during the summer recess and inform members that it is normal practice for committees to delegate authority to the chairperson and deputy chairperson during periods of recess to submit views on the releasing or withholding of information on non-routine contentious FOI requests. In the previous mandate, at one of the last meetings of each session, the committee agreed to this delegation of authority and the committee would be advised of any such requests. The views expressed by the chairperson and the deputy chairperson and the response issued by the FOI unit at the first available meeting following the recess period. Members, are we content? Content. Uh, no apologies. Um, to declare any relevant financial or other interests or each committee meeting is applicable. I don't think there are any interests. Looking at the agenda. Okay. Uh, draft minutes proceedings the 17th of June uh, are at page 8. Members, are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings? Yeah. Yeah. Are we content? Agreed to be published on the website. Great. Uh, number four, a uh, matter. Chair, just matter arising. I'm just about to start that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there. My apologies. She sort of got me, got me, got me out of there. Yeah. Sorry, uh, matters arising. Uh, the first one I had, uh, matters arising, was the NIO report on the Lambwell project. Uh, remind members that the committee wrote to the Public Accounts Committee on the 17th of June. You're in the Public Accounts Committee, aren't you? Let's see. Who's in the Public Accounts yes. Committee here? Yeah. Yes, yeah. and I am too. The committee wrote to the Public Accounts Committee on 17 June in relation to the follow-up report by the uh, Northern Ireland Audit Office on the Land Web Project. The response from the PAC is at page 15. Members, do we have any comments? Uh, so we are agreed to return, the, return to the matter once the Department responded to the PAC report. Okay. Thank you. Alicia, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, Chair, just as an issue that I feel that I have to address, um, and it's in relation to this committee, uh, and whenever we're actually hitting the national headlines, it's saying something about this committee, and uh, I'm not that sure if you uh, are aware of or if you've seen the article that was in the Irish News this week uh, in relation to the Finance Committee, where a particular reporter had tuned into this meeting and had watched it all the way through. Uh, and he described uh, the way that we had actually treated uh, officials and that from the department who had attended to give evidence. Now, had he had the opportunity to have viewed this committee on other occasions, he'd have seen probably the very same attitude being displayed towards people who do present themselves to this committee. There's an expression in Irish, Bulcha, Brishta, Augustpocha, which means battered, bruised, and broken. I often think, is that how one could describe the way that we do treat uh, officials who are only but doing their job, coming in here to present evidence to us, but that whenever we subject them to uh, the interrogation, and I have no difficulty with people asking questions one way or the other, none whatsoever, but I do think that there is a certain degree of civility that is required. And it is not limited to those that come in here to give evidence. On a number of different occasions, I have had to look to the chair when I would have spoken in the past that I was hearing a Don Chorus come from behind me, shouting at me, uh, or, or passing comment whenever I am speaking and the likes of it. And I think, too, that is a reflection of the bad manners that is displayed by this committee. Now, whenever it has got to the stage that we are actually uh, being presented in a national newspaper and everyone else is talking about us. And in fact, even here within this parliament, that all other committees are commenting about the poisonous atmosphere that exists in this committee, I think it is something that has to be taken on board. And I think it's a very, very serious issue for you as chair to take it on board, as each and every one of us has to as well, and ensure that anything that we do say that we're not there shouting and roaring or going down someone else's throat, attempting to intimidate them one way or the other. 
But I know anyway that uh, from what I've been experienced in here, I don't like it. And I really do think it's about time that people called a halt to that. and showed much more respect to each other, in particular, in particular to those that come in. Funny, I often heard my mother say, you never insult anyone in your own house. That was seen as a very cowardly thing to do. And I could only but describe it at times that the attitude displayed in here towards those that have come in to give evidence, we're the ones that's in our chamber. We have been insulting to them, and I think that has to stop. Thank you very much indeed. Noted. Um, <clears throat> I think the gentleman has a lot to learn. He's only in this institution. I've been here 26 years. Can I assure him that having sat through committees, I think every committee in this building for 26 years, what he has seen under your chairmanship uh, sir, has been absolutely nothing compared to what I've witnessed when things get really hot and heavy. That's the nature of politics. I don't agree with a word often he says. I have a right to say it. If he feels offended, well, that's just unfortunate. As far as the officials are concerned, they're very senior level uh, civil servants we're dealing with. Extremely well paid. They've had a benefit of the last three years without any public scrutiny because of the suspension of the Assembly. Therefore, part of the deal to get their fabulous salary is to take a very tough and robust questioning from uh, us as MLAs. They expect it. They get it. They take it in the chin. They go home and they laugh about it over tea. So, therefore, had there been some junior rank, I could understand what the gentleman is saying. But that is just the nature of politics. And frankly, if he doesn't like it, there's always Londonderry and Straban Council to return to. Sorry, Mr. Chair, just, there is no uh, Londonderry, Straban Council, Terry City and Straban. Sorry. Excuse me one second, Melissa. Okay. As chairman of this committee, the purpose of the Finance Committee is to hold the Department of Finance and the Minister to account. Yeah. The mere fact that we are having to hold officials to the degree of account that we are shows the effectiveness of this committee. And I value every single member of this committee and your ability to do your job. I value every member of the committee and their commentary. And I give you all equal time. But the one thing I will not have in this committee is any slacking in our ability to hold truth to power. Because the reason this Assembly came down because there was no accountability and responsibility and there was no push to truth to power. That is what we are going to say. I am going to move on to the next item. Uh, Judge Friedrich, can I ask, has there been any complaint from any official to this committee? No. Thank you. Next. I said, could, can I just for one second? Uh, I mean, I myself found myself one day really feeling very uncomfortable. And I stated it, I just said out loud how I felt on that day. But I said it earlier that this is a very, I, I believe, you know, I, I, and I'm only learning, it's a very powerful committee. We can bring people from outside, from the private sector, and we can question them. And with that question and with that evidence, we can bring that forward to, to Westminster or to Whitehall in order to lobby for the betterment of where we live. Now, I, that's, that's, I want to get into that type you know, of, of interrogation, if you like, bring them in. I mean, I'm going to pull it straight out. I mean, the £30 million which was given to a, a commercial company here for broadband, I don't think that's been delivered right. I would love to see that brought here. And I brought it up there last week. You know, COVID illustrates how important it is for us all here to try to work together. And businesses are going to suffer. We're moving into week 13, and week 13 is when the bills start to come in after the financial year starts. And we need to be thinking and looking out for our businesses and bringing them in and talking to them. And I want to thank all of the committee here that has helped with, with my perpetual uh, about the hospitality trade and about the bars. But I am fearful of where they are, and we need to look after those businesses. We need to get them. <coughs> Back onto the strong foot, and I want to commend, you know, the work which has been done. But that's what I want to be in this committee. I want to be out there, guiding and pushing forward ideas, and bring it to stronger 
powers which can really, uh, uh, you know, really bring that money and bring that experience over here. There are those that have that expertise, and I want them to be brought in. And I am saying that we should be thinking of that, and we should be using this platform in order to bring the private sector in here as well. Okay, thank you, Pat. Chair, Chair, if I, uh, uh, can we do need to move on. Uh, Chair, I, everyone else, I would like to just uh, say a piece on this because these scrutiny committees are so vitally important. Information is the currency of democracy. You take these committees lightly, you do the public out there a grave disservice. Now, I, have been, I have been nothing but impressed by the chairmanship of Steve Aiken and this committee and the robustness that we have taken on to get information out when it hasn't been available to us and we've had to squeeze it out at times. That's the work ethic of this committee which should be commended in the press, not, not uh, uh, to a detrimental effect. Now, can I, can I say that the committees, I've, I've experienced a lot of committees in my time and I've been in committees where it's been my own party's minister and other parties' ministers, and I have treated every single committee the, exactly the same. And can I say that if a committee has an offence and a defence within it, it doesn't work well. So my tip, my advice to members is this. There are ways of getting at the department without hitting your own minister, and it's, members should actually learn that trick. Because you know something? We are here to do a job, and we should be determined to do that. It's, we should never have uh, a rationale of nothing to see here. We delve, we dig deep, and we ask robust questions in order to get information, because information is the currency of democracy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Sorry, no, but we need yeah, to. I really, I really must, I really must. Well, listen, you've had, you have Please, had, sir. you have I, I, had I, I, your piece. Now, you can bring something up again in any other business, but we must move on. We have quite a lot to move through. And that item should have been brought up in any other business, not brought under under uh, matters arising. But I allowed you that position to speak to it. And as I said before, in this committee, when I'm a chairman, every member shall get equal speaking rights. Not like in other committees, where there seems to be a hierarchy of who gets to speak and what. Everybody in this committee gets exactly the same time and every opportunity to speak as we go through. So. Next is something completely under, on convert, on controversial. Letter to the Minister of Finance and Minister of Health. <laughs> Remind members at the meeting on the 17th of June, it was agreed to amend the congratulatory letter to the Minister of Finance and Minister of Health on the success of securing PPE delivery to circulate to members for agreement. Uh, the circulated amended letter had six responses from members. Three members were content, and three were not, and three were fairly ambivalent about it. I want to draw members' attention to the clerk's brief at page 17, the amended letter at page 18, and the initial letter at page 19. Now, can we come to a consensus to agree to this so we can actually sign the letter? Well, can I make a proposal that the original letter, as, um, as delivered by the secretary to the committee, uh, is voted on uh, and accepted by this committee and sent to the ministers? Is there a seconder in that proposal? Can I just say? Yes, I, I, I sent in a letter, sir, didn't I? I, I did respond that I was happy with that, as were other members. With the original or with the amended? With the original. The original. As other members were. So I believe yeah. that, I mean, I, I would be quite happy to second the that we send the original letter. Well, Chair, I'd have to say I don't see why we wouldn't want to recognise the source of where the PPE that we've actually had throughout most of the crisis has come from, namely the Four Nations. Mm -hmm. Why would we want to ignore that in the letter, since that was obtained by presumably these ministers? Why do we want to be selective in, say, in congratulating them or noting a single order from China and ignoring the bulk of the orders which came from the Four Nations. I don't want to ignore that. Uh, sorry, just to the chair. Sorry, just just before you go back, Matthew, because that was but Matthew's amendment yeah. letter. Yeah. No. Sorry, just so. Uh, sorry. Okay. I I have already apologised 
that I missed the, the, the first letter which came out on the Monday or the Tuesday. Right. I apologise to the committee that I missed that, but I was in favour of that letter when it was first proposed, the original letter. And I went back because I have seen other members here have voted in order to have that original letter as well. So the, the, the second part is um, to Mr Alistair. Uh, I hear what you're saying about the Four Nations, but the Treasury let go that money, and in a lot of good faith, it went to uh, Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales in order to do their own ordering. So I am, I, I, I am actually, I want that letter to go out as it originally was because we were really looking everywhere we possibly can to get PPE in, and there was none about. So I think they need to be commended, both the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance, as originally agreed or suggested here. So I am in favour of that, as it was. Um, uh, Matthew? Sorry, Matthew and then you, so. I believe it was my amendments to the letter that were um, rejected. I, on the basis of um, uh, moving on to more pressing things, I am content to support the original drafting of the letter. I would, however, like to put on record and it is somewhat connected to the previous discussion. Um, our committee is slightly getting bogged down, uh, is becoming polarised uh, in um, a very particular way. Um, there is a reasonable way to subject a department and the minister to scrutiny. Um, people should do that in the most precise, civil way they can. Um, and people should also respect the fact that scrutinising a minister is the job of this committee. So, with that in mind, I'm not quite, I don't quite understand why my uh, pretty minor amendments were objected to, but for the purposes of this committee moving on, which I think anyone who's, who is watching this would, would, would like us to, I'm happy to um, agree to the previous letter. I think we should talk about other things, to be perfectly honest. And, um, and I'm, I would just say, yeah, so perhaps I'll leave it at that. Sean? Yeah, just a quick point. This was uh, successfully uh, delivered by the two departments, the two ministers, and I missed the deadline. Um, sounds so free to the original. Right. Okay. I, I would have tried one brief point. I would just make sure I'm happy to. Sorry, but I'm happy to agree to the letter. However, I think I would also just put on the record that for colleagues here. Um, I've been trying to find the most rational, fair way of proceeding with scrutiny. If it's OK for this committee to write a congratulatory letter to a minister for doing his job, and it's reasonable for the committee to continue re uh, corresponding with the minister about other things to do with the department. So I would just make that point. Other than that, I'm happy to, um, happy to agree to the letter, being, the, the letter going. I must be the font of reasonableness. <laughs> You've got to agree to it, too. Because I've, I've been content with all three draftings. <laughs> Right. Uh, and again, I, I've been well, I think we're in agreement. But, we're finding agreement. Right. Okay. But can I just say that the, the, uh, the amendments have added to the letter. That's why I've been content. I okay. see absolutely no problem. Right. So we can draw a line under this one. <laughs> okay. Letter's going. Yes. All those in favour of the original letter say aye. 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 Any against? No. No. Okay. Sorry, sir. So that's, that's a formal proposal and vote to okay. send the original letter. Okay. I, 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 for, I formally propose we send the original letter. Do I have a seconder? You don't need a seconder, Chair. All oh, right. Okay. Fair enough. Right. So, and I've recorded those for and against. Good. Right. I'm sorry. And your, yourself, Chair? Your oh, yeah. I'll sign it. Yeah. I'll get rid of it. Right. Okay, uh, next item, uh, matters arising. Permanent Secretary, inform members the response from the Permanent Secretary as questions follow the briefing as tabled at page 19. Ask members for any comments. Please have a close look at that. Sorry, page 19 of the table. Tables. Tables. Oh, the table. Uh, Thank you, Jim. It's I think you'll find it on page 22, 21 and 22. Of the table? Yeah, of the table papers. Yeah. Apologies, members. Yeah, I'm just looking at it. Yeah, could I comment about the, um, the answer to the second question? Um, the Permanent Secretary to provide clarity on how, in the absence of a minister, was funding for the North South bodies authorised, if it was legal, and if not, were they counts of those bodies qualified? And the Permanent Secretary says during the period 
In the absence of Minister of Department of Finance officials approved the payments of grants by sponsored departments to the North South bodies as permitted by the 99 order. This ensures the continuation of service to everybody while avoiding illegal spend. Therefore, the accounts of the bodies were not qualified on the basis of illegal expenditure. I'm very surprised by that answer. Just for a point of clarity, but the accounts weren't qualified at all from the answer that was given in the Assembly the other day. I would have to check counsel. No, they weren't. She's saying that's why they weren't qualified. But the point is this, that if you go to the schedules of the North-South Cooperation Order of 1999 and go to Part 7 of Schedule 1 of Annex 2, <coughs> convoluted document, but Um, bear with me one moment. It says the body will receive grants from money voted by the Northern Ireland Assembly and Dáil Éireann. North South Ministerial Council will, with the approval of the finance ministers, make recommendations as to the amounts of such grants. So it's quite clear that what the order requires is finance ministers to recommend the grants. There, were no finance minister, there was no finance minister in Northern Ireland, so how which was the basis of my question as to how then the, the expenditure was legal. Uh, so I would like the Permanent Secretary to address um, Part 7, Paragraph 2 of Annex 2 of Schedule 1 of the order. I think I've got all that correct. Mm. So what page are we on, Chair? It's on page 21, the table papers. Lisa, it's the third question down. And it's the question on north-south bodies and the fact that the accounts haven't been qualified. But also it's on the issue of spending, because if there isn't a finance minister to authorise the spending, mm. it should have either been done... It, the only way it could have been done would be by a direct authority by the Secretary of State or mm -hmm. through an Act mm -hmm. of Parliament, yep. which I don't think we've seen either of. And I don't think on the various finance bills that were passed by Parliament when this place was, uh, when we were stood down. I must admit, as finance spokesman, I don't think I ever came across any, qu any comments on that. So it's a worthy question. We ask the... Yes, sir, that's Schedule 1-7. A... A, I'll, I'll confirm it. It's Schedule 1... Uh, part seven. I think it's. I think there's an annex in there somewhere. I'll get the exact reference. You said annex two. Yeah, I think it did. Sorry. I think it's annex one. Of schedule one. Part seven. Part seven. No, sorry. Correct myself. It is annex two. You're right. Part seven. Any other comments? Uh, just to make your life a complete misery, but I'll raise it anyhow. The issue of the public contract regulations, 2015, and all government procurement contracts and directives, and how they're to be managed. And obviously, one of the issues we have, and we've been discussing at length, obviously, around the PPE order, is where within was there a, an issue raised with the EU public procurement laws? which we are still subject to and probably will be subject to for quite a lot longer. There is an issue there that, uh, whereas we have heard that at length about the need to maintain confidentiality and issues of orders and PP and the rest of it, the question is this was a substantial public procurement piece, and the fact it was a public procurement piece were the appropriate procedures followed. And again, one of the issues and we have to be very cautious of is that we are, in many respects, guardians and custodians of the public money and the public purse. So the question we have to ask, and one of the things we must do, is that the, how the procurement process went. And I am not aware of the particular PPE order 
have been placed within that European context, which is what it may have been may have done. So that's a question we might have to think about uh, when we get some response from our emails, and that's an issue we need to have a look at. But I would ask the committee to be mindful of that particular issue, and it's not something that can be sort of sidestepped away by force majeure. You can't do that, and it's just a, an issue of considerable concern, and I think it's something we need to be aware of. Okay. Any other further comments? Uh, at the present moment in time, we were supposed to be hearing about in-year monitoring outcome of the June monitoring round, which is rapidly becoming the July monitoring round. Uh, I draw a member's attention from the letter of the Minister tabled at page 20. I would advise members it has not yet been confirmed, but it may be assumed that the item will be considered by the Executive in time for the Minister to make a statement next week. Um, I am remarkably disappointed. And I think I speak for all of this committee, or should be speaking for all of this committee, in that the process of monitoring rounds, the process of being kept informed, the process of the detail coming through to all the committees has been, to say the least, laggardly. And I have a considerable degree of concern that now, which should have been the June monitoring round, we are not going to see it until next week, which would make it the July monitoring round. Bearing in mind the problems we have had with estimates, and I take what has been said time and time again that we are in the middle of the COVID crisis and we are to do this and the rest of it. But we have all seen from what was then the table papers, which has not come in front of us, there has been a considerable volume of work on this issue. And to find next week that we are going to be uh, dropped on this bearing in mind the length of time we have before we break up potentially for recess in August, there is a real issue here about scrutiny and accountability. And I am not, as chairman of this committee, very happy at all to be in this situation. Is that here, bearing in mind we were supposed to receive it at the beginning of June, and now we are going to receive it at the beginning of July. I do not think that that is particularly acceptable. However, uh, bearing in mind we have not got it, I would like your approval to uh, defer this agenda item until the 1st of July, possibly. Are we content? Oh. Yeah. Can I just ask on that, Chair, um, and I am betraying some of my inexperience and naivete in terms of um, what is the advice perhaps the clerk could advise on um, how we conduct business during recess? Is there um, our committees? Um, so obviously we don't have plenary settings during recess, but are, how much can committees do in terms of scrutiny whenever the assembly is in recess? What, what, what kinds of correspondence can we engage with? What kinds of can we have any meetings? Um, generally speaking, uh, under generally or in, <laughs> or, in, or in extremists, <laughs> would it be preferable to return to this under the forward work program? Well, yes, we can look under the forward work program. Yeah, yeah. okay, it, we'll bring it up in that list. Right. Uh, next item on the agenda: subordinate legislation SL1, the rates, automatic telling machines, designation of rural, rural areas, order Northern Ireland 2020. I'd like to draw members' attention to the following papers to the agenda: the briefing note on page 209, the rates, automatic telling machine, designation of rural areas, order Northern Ireland, page 210. Now, the purpose of this draft rule is to update the, update the eligible wards following the previous rule on 2016 for the purpose of providing a rates exemption of automatic telling machines. The regulations are subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. This is the Committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1. It has not been possible to amend this once the regulations have been made and led in the Assembly Business Office. Members, do we have any comments? Are we in agreement? Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, the committee has considered the Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the rates, automatic telling machine, designation of rural order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Next item on the agenda, subordinate legislation, the rates, coronavirus, electronic communications amendment order, Northern Ireland 2020. Clark's briefing notice at page 13, or pa sorry, page 2013. The SL1 is at page 2014. I'd like to inform members this order amends Article 62 of the Rates Northern Ireland Order uh, 1977, in order to allow district valuers certificates to issue electronically rather than by post. Due to the impact of COVID out 
2019 outbreak in Northern Ireland, this electronic rule has been developed to provide LPS valuation staff with an alternative legal means of issuing certificates as a result of operational limitations created by the COVID arrangements. The regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. This is the Committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1, as it is not possible to amend this once the regulations have been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. Members, do we have any comments? If we are content, we are content uh, that the Committee has considered the Department of Pharma Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the Rates Coronavirus Electronic Communications Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Move on to subordinate legislation, SL1, the Rates Coronavirus Emergency Relief No. 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. I should draw your members' attention to the following papers, the briefing note on page 2017 and the rates um, regulations 2020 on page 219. Inform members that the purpose of the statutory rule is to make provision to provide emergency rate relief in order to help business rate payers who are facing financial impacts arising from the serious public health issues caused by COVID-19. The regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure. This is the Committee's opportunity to consider the policies set out in the SL1 as it is not possible to amend this once the regulations have been made and led in the Assembly Business Office. But given the importance of this legislation and the consideration by this committee, the Committee for the Economy and other committees of the gaps in support to business, the Committee may wish to take the opportunity to consider the SL1 in more detail before agreeing to it. Uh, we remind members that next week we have the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre is due to provide oral evidence to the Committee next week on its rates relief information paper. So, I am asking your committee uh, your approval uh, agreement to invite officials to provide oral evidence at next week's committee meeting following the oral evidence suggestion from the Ulster University, which I think is appropriate that we hear from the Ulster University what sort of the, uh, their sort of analysis has been. And then forward the SL1 to the Committee for the Economy to seek its views on the extent of which the proposed legislation addresses the gaps in support to business. Pat, you might want to speak to that, but one of the issues we've had is the gaps and how we fill the gaps. And I think it's appropriate that we listen to the Ulster University's evidence first to be able to look at that and then take the officials to that. So that gives us a thing Great. if you're content Thanks. with that. Okay. And then I would like your uh, approval to consider the SL1 again next week following these evidence sessions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, subordinate legislation, SL1, the Valuation, Telecommunications, Natural Gas and Water Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. I draw attention to the following papers relating to the agenda item. The clerk's briefing open page 223. Uh, the SL1, the Valuation, Telecommunications, Natural Gas and Water Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, on page 224. Inform the members the nature of telecommunications and natural gas undertakings requires companies working in these fields to occupy our own various properties in more than one place. Paragraph 4 of Article 37 of the Rates Northern Ireland Order 1977 empowers the Department to describe by regulations that anything that would, apart from the regulations, be more than one hereditament shall be treated as one hereditament. The regulations are subject to the negative reg reg resolution procedure before the Assembly. Advise members this is the Committee's opportunity to con consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it is not possible to amend this once the regulations have been made and led in the Assembly Business Office. Can I seek your agreement, members? There is a question here with some companies who, and I mean as members of this, as MLAs, you will have all had representations from companies that have uh, multiple premises and some of the concerns about where they are uh, taking businesses from. Now, if we are making this SL1 to support telecommunications and natural gas, which are utilities, should we also be considering asking the question whether we should be asking that for other companies as well they are in a similar situation? Now, that is probably not pursuant to this SL1, oh. because this specifically refers to telecommunications, natural gas and water. But if the principle is here, should we not also be looking at the principle for other companies that are in a similar situation? Sorry, go ahead. Chair, yeah, uh, funny, whenever I was reading that, I was thinking exactly the same thing. Uh, but I wasn't confining it to rates. 
Uh, it has been a problem as well too where uh, a company has a number of different premises in different locations uh, and as a result of that they only were able to uh, actually access one grant as opposed to we'll say a grant for each one of the individual um, businesses that were located in different areas throughout the whole of the province as well too like that was where they were located not just all in the one town or anything else so that not only are we, are we talking here about rates but it could be too about accessibility to i'm support. minded to ask the committee we we need to do this sl1 and i think we're in agreement with the sl1 but i'm minded to write to the department of economy to have a a look specifically at this area because if we're having this if we're putting this legal process through for utilities I think there's got wider implications for other companies across Northern Ireland. Are you content that we write to the economy? Department of Economy or the Department of Finance in relation to rates? I see it's both, I think. But I think it's it is also rates, but I think we should also we should write it to rates, but we should also do a separate paragraph that refers to uh, business uh, the business grant scheme. Yeah. And we should info it to the Department for Economy, but also info it to Quiva in the Economy Committee. Are you happy with that, yeah. Deputy yeah. Chair? Yeah. All those agreements, aye? Aye. 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 Okay. If we're right, let's move on. Uh, the committee aye. has considered the Department of Finance for its pro proposal for subordinate legislation, the valuation of telecommunications, natural gas and water amendment regulations, Northern Ireland, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Content. Agreed. Uh, moving on to item number 10, uh, written briefing, uh, sale of NAMA assets in Northern Ireland, written briefing from the National Crime Agency. I could draw members' attention to the following papers relating to the agenda item, uh, the NCA briefing regarding Operation Pumpless on page 228. Remind members that this matter is subject to an ongoing investigation and as such the committee should be aware of the need to avoid prejudicing the investigation. I'll ask members to comment on the letter. Chair, can I say um, I was presently surprised by the detail. Yes. Mm. Uh, and it's encouraging to note the scale of operation that seems to have been launched. The very quantum of what it tells us has been delivered to the PPS uh, indicates a lot of work. And we know, of course, as I think we did from the public anyhow, public media, that matters have been with the PPS from January of last year. So hopefully things are progressing. Um, I think it provides a useful basis for a number of follow-up questions mm -hmm. uh, next week. And it's interesting to see the reference to the parallel investigation in the United States. So there's lots of interesting material there that I think the committee will want to explore. Mm. Next week, uh, just as a matter for the clerk, uh, normally when we put a, a document like that comes across where it's written on the top of the document and the heading, the footer, security classification, they normally put in the security what classification. It is. Um, could we just find out to make sure that <laughs> speaking as somebody for many many years has, <laughs> has struggled to make sure they've always had the correct sort of header and footer on every document they ever produced? And I don't think I ever wrote anything much below the level of secret anyhow. Um, I just find, I would just query whether they left off the security classification at the top and bottom of the page. Chair, uh, that was checked with the, the NCA, and though that's not the case. Okay. Right, okay. I would. Okay, okay. No okay. Class, I've, I have raised them. <laughs> Sorry, did the. But if, if members wish, I, I will confirm it again and, and write to members after the meeting and email members. No, if they have if they've confirmed that it's there is no security classification on it, um, yeah, I think we would be content. Okay. okay. Uh, and the informal confidential briefing with the MCA will take place on Wednesday, the 1st of July, in room 115 at 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. Okay, correspondence for Committee for Communities regarding visual impairment on page 237. Can I seek your agreement to forward that letter to the Department of Finance? Could I declare an interest as the chair of the All Party Group on visual impairment? Okay, Jim, do you want to say anything else? About no, the... just to say in okay. case it ever is. 
Uh, move the correspondence from the Committee for the Economy regarding COVID-19 financial support, page 239. I'd like your secret agreement to forward to the University of Ulster, asking them to respond when they provide oral evidence to the Committee on the 1st of July. And also seek your agreement to inform the Committee for the Economy that this has been done. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, correspondence from the Committee for the Economy regarding this need for partnership to rebuild the economy, page 274. I would like to forward that letter to the University of Ulster as well, if we are content. A correspondence from the Committee for the Region regarding a House of Lords International Agreement Subcommittee inquiry on page 280. Members, do have we any comment? Okay. Are we agreed to note? Uh, page two, uh, next, response from the Committee for the Economy, page 291. And the Committee for Infrastructure on page 292, particularly on financial support, road haulage, taxi industry and transport sector. Jim, I know you had a particular view on that. Oh, um, you know, it's one of the disappointments of the handouts in relation to um, a industry that the haulage sector does not seem it's its cries seem to have been ignored. Um, I certainly know from some of the large operators that they feel as deserving as other sectors, but there seemed to be a diffidence between economy and infrastructure about uh, heading up a bid. And Finance Minister told us on more than one occasion there was a pot of money which could be considered, but it seems a bid never came forward, which is very disappointing. Um, again, I don't particularly wish to comment on the um, in-year monitoring, because of course we haven't officially had the in-year monitoring yet, but we will be aware from the papers that we didn't receive the fact that there is still a substantial amount of money held centrally for transportation. Mm. and. I find it of concern that the Department, the Minister for Infrastructure and the Minister for the Economy haven't got this together again, mm. because I have had representations from the haulage industry mm. and from the taxi industry. And I think sort of, Sean, uh, there are various sort of, uh, representations we have all had. And I find it quite surprising that um, they haven't come to some kind of plan to be able to support this. Yeah. And I think a way forward we should have, as the Committee for Finance, having received this information and having raised this issue, is to again communicate directly with, and I think we should communicate directly with the ministers of infrastructure and the economy, info the uh, relevant committees, and say that we find it surprising that at this stage, and bearing in mind the pressures that the haulage industry, taxi industry, and the transport sector are coming under. There hasn't been any applications made for a centrally head, held support. Um, uh, if you're uh, content with that, I think yeah. I would. Uh, I would like to. Certainly present. agree. One certainly left with something of suspicion that uh, ministers in one or other of those departments have their eyes on some of that transport money for other purposes. Mm. But it's COVID money that's ring fenced. Specifically to support our transportation and our haulage, or our logistics. Well, is it, is it expressly ring fence for that? No, but my my understanding of it, it's gone in centrally. But yeah. every time it's been reported to us in this committee, yeah. and we've seen it in the committee, it's, been it's always been under a line of specifically let out for uh, transport issues. Mm. So, you know, yes, it is held centrally. But the minister, to give him his due regard, has recognised that yeah. that is specifically for mm. issues to do with transportation. And in fairness to the minister, he has said more than once yes, we're there. he's open to a bid. But he has never one. come forward. Can I ask? Sir, go ahead, Paul. I, I agree. This is a, a very fatal and important issue because the haulage companies, in particular, who have had to keep their wheels turning the whole way through this process to bring us food, mm -hmm. uh, if nothing else, many other things, of course. And have had to grapple with uh, ill staff, with furloughed staff, sheltered uh, shielding staff, and it's put them under immense pressure. 
which all comes at a cost. Um, and I, I think you know there must most certainly is a deserving element to support for the haulage industry. Uh, but it also I think highlights. Well, you know, if a minister has decided politically that it's not deserving, then I think we're entitled to know. Yeah. But but second of all, does it not show a, a, a deficiency within the system that if the finance minister who's prepared to accept the bid, mm -hmm. look at a bid, but he, he seemingly can't do anything to to function that, so he has to rely on a bid from another department. Uh, so there seems to be a fundamental weakness where a critical issue like this can fall between two stools mm. uh, and, and function isn't flowing the way it maybe should be. Uh, it's something that we might have to explore going forward and on any guise, on any issue whereby a department deems something not necessary or not deserving, but the finance minister does, or is at least prepared to look at it. Mm -hmm. so there's a more fundamental issue here. I think. Yeah, but I think if that's the recommendation, I would like to, uh, I would like to do that. I would like to write to both the uh, economy and infrastructure minister to uh, ask the question why. Sir, you just did I not ask? Was that not? Did I not propose we asked that uh, last week or the week before? Mm. I think we because raised we didn't it. Know, pardon? We, we raised it with the committees yeah, before, we didn't know, not the ministers. We didn't know whose brief that said. No, we, we raised it, and it was raised in the assembly. But we, yeah. this is the first time we've had something coming back and saying yeah. it's down to the fact that infrastructure and the economy can't decide what they're doing yes, about it, is. which doesn't answer the question for the haulage industry, right. and it doesn't answer the minister uh, question for our minister because our minister has allocated the money, mm. um, even mm. though it's a central pot, but he's put it on a line item, and um, sure. you know we're going. Yeah. yeah, it's in the letter there, 298, 95 million set aside for transport yeah. issues, which he had allocated 2.2 to the ferry industry. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, what are the, the mean, last time he told us there was still 59 million left. Yeah. Money went to Translink, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's we'll action that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, if we move now to uh, the forward, oh sorry, if we move on now, um, so members content to note chair the remaining items of correspondence. Yes, yeah, sorry. The information. Oh, so we content to note the remaining items of correspondence. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, if we move to the forward work program, uh, the updated forward work, work program for July 2020 is at page 328. Uh, look, we haven't received the in-year monitoring outcome of the sorry July monitoring round, as it's now going to become, has been deferred. This and the committee's decision to receive oral evidence in the SL1 rates, coronavirus emergency relief number two regulations has resulted in a very heavy agenda. That's the case, and bearing in mind we are not going into recess, as I understand it, until August at the earliest. I would like to uh, hold a, an additional meeting on the 8th of July uh, to consider a possible SR relating to the rates, coronavirus uh, emergency relief regulations. Uh, defer the research uh, presentation relating to the independence of the Commissioner for Public Appointments until that date. Jim? Sorry. Um, we are going to defer the research presentation relating to the independence of the Commission for Public Appointments until the 8th of July. Yeah. Enough of that? Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I was just sorry, I was checking with the temporary speaker about the <coughs> status of the uh, recess up till August. Has that been confirmed? No, I don't. But I, I, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Jim, have you got any further? Yeah, we, we got a message saying that we were going to continue to meet in July because of the coronavirus issue. That um, it was a fluid situation, and the only definite adjournment would be the month of August. Right. But you know, anything can happen. If there's a major outbreak or something, we could all be hauled back. So, if you're, you know, thinking going off to Madeira or uh, or somewhere like that, I would advise it June, July. Okay. And uh, we also discussed during. A, uh, if we're, are we content to schedule another fifth of July? Yeah. Yep. Content. And the committee. And we also we consider the consent the committee's operational plan for 2021. Uh, with that proviso, are we content with the forward work program? Uh, do we have any other business? Yes. Yeah. Sure.
Paul first and then. Yeah, just to, can I, can I, sorry for doing this, but can I go back to the departmental uh, request page, which is in correspondence? Sorry for having to take you back. Is that my understanding that we are still outstanding some documents, uh, a deadline there of the 10th of June for the function of government, uh, miscellaneous provisions bill, for the department to provide a response to the questions raised in the memo from the clerk? What page is that, Paul? Uh, it's page 320 of our PACs. Sorry, just let and me. It's, and it's, first, that, and it's that on that page. So the meeting request was the 13th of May, but the deadline was the 10th of June. Uh, the, for the department to provide a response to the questions raised in a memo from the clerk. Hmm. So the meeting request date was... You had the deadline down as the 10th of June. And the, the two pages after that, then, there are, there are financial scrutiny considerations. The deadline 19th of June, the next two pages, uh, which are still outstanding to you, I take it, which was the disciplinary proceedings, the processes mm -hmm. arising from the RHI inquiry and the financial scrutiny considerations of options. Uh, they're still outstanding. So what page is that on? Uh, so it's 320, 321 and 322. 322. You know what I'm like, Jeffrey Deadly. So everything in 320 has been, the third column there is received. So one received okay. 13th of June, one on the 17th. Oh, sorry, so that's the date received. Yeah. The, yeah, the date, the first date is the date of request, the second one's right. the deadline, and the third one's the date received. Okay, so that's 320 sorted. Thank you for that. I'm sorry for causing that confusion. 321 then and 322 which seems to be two outstanding pieces of mm. information one on uh, financial scrutiny and one on the disciplinary processes arising from the RHI inquiry mm. have we had any communication from the department as to why the, the they have missed the deadline N not that I recall I, but I, I can't check that with the team yeah, I think we also need an explanation as to why they've missed a deadline. Mm. There may be a reasonable excuse. So that was on page... 321. 321 and 322. 322. Yeah. 321 and 322, same yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. I think the clock's ticking in the RHI one, because we yeah. know there are certain people leaving. Yeah. At the end of August. <laughs> Simple. And of course, all their emails get automatically deleted, unless your bill goes through. <coughs> yeah, sorry, Melissa. Uh, Chair, yes. Um, and I'm not going to labour this, but uh, I think it was a bit rich for people to attempt to uh, hide behind um, investigative powers, we'll say, of this committee, um, when in fact I was talking not about the investigative powers of this committee or not in any way at all attempt to limit anyone in their questioning. What I was talking about was something much more basic than that, basic good manners. Um, and that um, I, I talked about seeing an end to the bullying that goes on whenever officials now would come in uh, here. Just, uh, and don't Melissa, Melissa, before you go that way, very careful if you use the language. Yep. We do not permit bullying or aggressive behaviour beyond any of the, the normal bounds of the assembly are good procedure. I'm glad to hear that. And I have to say that it hasn't always been my experience, uh, but I'm glad to hear that. And what I'm saying is that I still think that people should have, as we do have that right, to interrogate and to investigate. And in no way at all am I attempting to limit uh, the committee's powers in that respect. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Pat? Thanks very much, Chair. Um, and not under any other business. Um, as I said, this is the third time today, and I, I just want us to try and get that wee bit more involved. And I want to find that we, as a committee, uh, I'm hearing reports that the finance minister is working up a good relationship within uh, the treasury. I don't know if that's right, or I don't know if it's wrong. But surely, if we were able to try and get something going here, regardless of who our minister is when they go across. And I was asked the finance minister in his interactions with the department what he's had with the Treasury to extend the reported, you know, the temporary cut to the value added tax. 
uh, for certain sectors in Northern Ireland to make a statement on the matter. A temporary cut the value added is being considered by the Chancellor Rishi Suka yep. with specific reductions uh, for certain sectors reported in the Financial Times. However, any decrease in VAT which could be announced in July would then be followed by the deferred tax rises and cuts to public spending in the autumn budget. The paper says cutting VAT to 15 per cent is advocated by former Chancellor Alistair Darling in a joint report with Jerry uh, Lyons of the Policy Exchange. I think that if we could write that letter and state those facts, it shows that you know, it shows that we are trying to be programmed, we are trying to get ourselves in. And if the, if the Minister goes he has a bit of paper from the Finance Committee in order to try and see does that help Specifically that on VAT reduction? On VAT reduction. Can we, uh, with the Committee's agreement, and bearing in mind how sort of the Westminster process works, can we as a Committee have an agreement to write to the Minister next week, and the reason I'm saying that is because, knowing how Westminster works, this has been trialled out, so I would imagine we'll probably be here sooner rather than later what the issue yeah. is. I think it's important that we understand the implications of a reduction in VAT, and you know, I would be delighted to see VAT reduced to 5 per cent on some of the hospitality industry, so yeah. it matches what they have on the rest of this island, but uh, I think we probably wait to next week, and if we can table that for next week, Pat, because okay. I just think we will have been we, we'd been asking the minister to do something that is probably going to happen, and then we'd, we'd be at a different situation. And just one more little point, folks. I, I, I look at the committee, and we're blessed with just one lady in it. All right, and I know when we bring in some of of our witnesses. Uh, I know it's not meant to be, but we are. We're, we're uh, eight or nine, men, eight men, and we only have the one lady. So I'm not accusing anyone. I'm just saying if we could temper to that just a little bit. Rubbish. Uh, pardon, rubbish. Yes, oh, I, not, I, sir, there's no uh, shrink and valid. Jim, pardon? Jim, through, through the chair. Through the I chair. didn't interrupt you, uh, <laughs> Jim. You know, I, I, I just felt uncomfortable two weeks ago. We've had the discussion, and it's not to reopen it, but I have to agree with what our, our other member has said across the table. Okay. From that, that has been that has that has been duly noted, and your comments Thank to you. Jim have been duly noted. Paul, oh, short yeah, one, please. Uh, can, can I uh, just add that uh, the member here has made accusations around bullying and intimidation? Mm. I would like that member to list out those incidents so that we can investigate, because that's a very serious accusation to make. Uh, on the point about robust and challenging questions, that is our role, regardless of gender or sex. In fact, that should not at all ever come into it, nor, should, nor do I ever look at someone in that guise. Uh, so to be labelling that, to be labelling the committee as having some sort of discrimination against that, I think that's really bad. I think that's a really bad signal to send out, because that's not my intention one bit, and I don't think any member here is in that way inclined. Uh, so, you know, I think this committee, some of our members need to maybe take a look at what a scrutiny committee does, what it's meant to do, and its roles and functions, and how it's meant to operate. I think this committee operates very good, robust and challenging as it is. Uh, but I would like to see those accusations listed down uh, of bullying and intimidation. No, just, Jim. Well, first of all, the honourable member for Bleak uh, has been here for three years. Yeah, we need to. Uh, she's certainly no shy about hiring ballot, and at no stage either. I understand why, because of her long journey, at, but at no stage either remotely or in the speaking has she or any other lady complained about the conduct of her fellow committee members. It does nothing for the emancipation of women and for equality of women to treat them any different in this Assembly than any other MLA. They have had a tough, rough election campaign. They have knocked doors, they have been chased, they have been insulted, and therefore they are ready for the rough and tumble that we all have to face in this Assembly. And can I tell you, we endured Katrina around here for nine years, and I can tell you, after you faced her, give me any rough, tough, tough man any day because she, would, she gave as good as she got, and that's the way it should be. Mm. And through the, kind of, through the no. chair, I wasn't uh, speaking of, uh, of her member. I was speaking of the witnesses. <laughs> bad hearing makes bad rehearsing. 
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to draw very shortly this uh, committee to a close. There has been a degree of robust discussion amongst ourselves. Any tears? Uh, no, not at no. all. And I think we all know that within the wider context of the political game in Northern Ireland, we have all been involved in this. But the one thing, and I'll make this abundantly clear, I will not tolerate any accusations of bullying. I will not tolerate any bullying in this committee. I will not tolerate any interpret language in this committee. But I will encourage you all to be robust in your questioning. Use your detailed knowledge to raise these issues to the fore. And I think the interesting thing is that if we are achieving some degree of interest from outside this building, it shows that perhaps we are doing our job. And for that, I thank every single one of you. And on that point, I am now drawing this committee meeting to an end. And I welcome you. Uh, we're meeting the National Crime Agency at 10.30 on Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning, room 115. Room 115. And then How long the committee is that scheduled for? You know? uh, I don't think it is, but the committee meeting is at 12.30. So oh, I know. Yeah. 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 Wish to get lunch. Well, and there. the committee meeting starts at 12.30. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Cheers. You, Thank, you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.